Okay, here we go with chapter six. More than the summer was over, the season of friendship in our valley was fading with the sun's warmth. Fletcher was back and he had his contract. He was talking in town that he would need the whole range again. The homesteaders would have to go. All right, so there we see that central conflict, okay, about how they're gonna use the land, open rangers versus homesteaders. He was a reasonable man, he was saying in his smooth way, and he would pay a fair price for any improvements they had put in. But we know, we knew what Luke Fletcher would call a fair price, and we had no intention of leaving. The land was ours by right of settlement, guaranteed by the government. Only we knew, too, how far away the government was from our valley way up there in the territory. The nearest marshal was a good hundred miles away. We did not even have a sheriff in our town. There never had been any reason for one. When folks had any lawing to do, they would head for Sheridan, nearly a full day's ride away. Our town was small, not even organized as a town. It was growing, but it was still not much more than a roadside settlement. The first people there were three or four miners who had come prospecting after the blow up of the Bighorn Mining Association about 20 years before and had found gold traces leading to a moderate vein in the jutting rocks that partially closed off the valley where it edged into the plain. You could not have called it a strike for others that followed were soon disappointed. Those first few, however, had done fairly well and had brought in their families and a number of helpers. Then a stage and freighting line had picked the site for a relay post. That meant a place where you could get drinks as well as horses, and before long, cowboys from ranches out on the plain and Fletcher's spread in the valley were drifting in of an evening. With us homesteaders coming now, one or two more almost every season, the town was taking shape. Already there were several stores, a harness and blacksmith shop, and nearly a dozen houses. Just the year before, the men had put together a one-room schoolhouse. Sam Grafton's place was the biggest. He had a general store with several rooms for living quarters back of it in one half of his rambling building, a saloon with a long bar and tables for cards and the like in the other half. Upstairs, he had some rooms he rented to stay stray drummers or anyone else stranded overnight. He acted as our postmaster, an elderly man, a close bargainer, but honest in all his dealings. Sometimes he served as a sort of magistrate in minor disputes. That means like a judge. His, his wife was dead. His daughter Jane kept house for him and was our school teacher when school was in session. Even if we had had a sheriff, he would have been Fletcher's man. Fletcher was the power in the valley in those days. We homesteaders had been around only a few years, and the other people still thought of us as there by his sufferance, meaning because he allowed it to be that way. He had been running cattle through the whole valley at the time the miners arrived having bought or bulldozed out the few small ranchers there ahead of him. A series of bad years working up to the dry summer and terrible winter of 86 had cut his herds about the time the first of the homesteaders moved in, and he had not objected too much. But now there were seven of us in all, and the number rising each year. It was a certain thing, Father used to say, that the town would grow and swing our way. Mr. Grafton knew it too, I guess, but he was a careful man who never let thoughts about the future interfere with present business. The others were the kind to veer with the prevailing wind. Fletcher was the big man in the valley, so they looked up to him and tolerated us. Led to it, they probably would have helped him run us out. With him out of the way, they would just as willingly accept us. In other words, they'll, they're followers. Whoever's around, they'll follow. And Fletcher was back with a contract in his pocket. Okay, and remember the contract is with the government to grow beef for the Indian reservations. And Fletcher was back with a contract in his pocket wanting his full range again. 
There was a hurried council in our house soon as the news was around. That means they had a meeting. They're going to have a conversation about it. Our neighbor toward town, Lou Johnson, who heard it in Grafton's store, spread the word and arrived first. He was followed by Henry Shipstead, who had the place next to him, the closest to town. These two had been the original homesteaders, staking out their 180s two years before the drought and riding out Fletcher's annoyance until the cut in his herds gave him other worries. They were solid, dependable men, old line farmers who had come west from Iowa. You could not say quite as much for the rest, straggling in at intervals. James Lewis and Ed Howells were two middle-aged cowhands who had grown dissatisfied and tagged father into the valley, coming pretty much on his example. Lacking his energy and drive, they had not done too well and could be easily discouraged. Frank Torrey from farther up the valley was a nervous, fidgety man with a querulous wife and a string of dirty kids growing longer every year. He was always talking about pulling up stakes and heading for California. But he had a stubborn streak in him, and he was always saying, too, that he'd be damned if he'd make tracks, in other words, be run out of town, just because some big-hatted rancher wanted him to. Ernie Wright, who had the last stand up the valley, butting out into the range still used by Fletcher, was probably the weakest of the lot. Okay, so notice this description of Ernie Wright. It becomes important later on. He was probably the weakest of the lot, not in any physical way. He was a husky, likable man, so dark complected that there were rumors he was part Indian. He was always singing and telling tall stories, but he would be off hunting when he should be working, and he had a quick temper that would trap him into doing fool things without taking thought. Okay, so he's um, got a hot temper, and he looks like he's part Indian, okay? He was as serious as the rest of them that night. Mr. Grafton had said that this time Fletcher meant business. His contract called for all beef, all the beef he could drive in the next five years, and he was determined to push the chance to the limit. But what can he do, asked Frank Torrey. The land's ours as long as we live on it, and we get title in three years. Some of you fellows have already proved up, meaning you've already done your time, you own the land. He won't really make trouble, chimed in James Lewis. Fletcher's never been the shooting kind. He's a good talker, but talk can't hurt us. Several of the others nodded. Johnson and Chipstead did not seem to be so sure father had not said anything yet, and they all looked at him. Jim's right, he admitted. Fletcher hasn't ever let his boys get careless that away. Not yet, anyhow. That ain't saying he wouldn't, if there wasn't any other way. There's a hard streak in him, but he won't get real tough for a while. I don't figure he'll start moving cattle in now till spring. My guess is he'll try putting pressure on us this fall and winter, see if he can wear us down. He'll probably start right here. He doesn't like any of us, but he doesn't like me most. That's true. Ed Howells was expressing the unspoken verdict that father was their leader. How do you figure he'll go about it? My guess on that, father said, drawling now and smiling a grim little smile, like he knew he was holding a good whole card in a tight game. That's a poker reference, a card game. My guess on that is that he'll begin by trying to convince Shane here that it isn't healthy to be working with me. You mean the way he began Ernie Wright? Yes, father cut him short. I mean the way he did with young Morley. I was peeping around the door of my little room. I saw Shane sitting off to one side, listening quietly as he had been right along. He did not seem the least bit surprised. He did not seem the least bit interested in finding out what had happened to young Morley. I knew what had. I had seen Morley come back from town, bruised and a beaten man, and gather his things and curse father for hiring him and ride away without once looking back. 
Yet Shane sat there quietly, as if what had happened to Morley had nothing to do with him. He simply did not care what it was. And then I understood why. It was because he was not Morley, he was Shane. Father was right. In some strange fashion, the feeling was abroad that Shane was a marked man. Attention was on him as a sort of symbol. By taking him on, Father had accepted, in a way, a challenge from the big ranch across the river. What had happened to Morley had been a warning, and Father had deliberately answered it. The long unpleasantness was sharpened now after the summer lull. The issue in our valley was plain and would, in time, have to be pushed to a showdown. If Shane could be driven out, there would be a break in the homestead ranks, a defeat going beyond the loss of a man into the realm of prestige and morale. It could be the crack in the dam that weakens the whole structure and finally lets through the flood. The people in town were more curious than ever, not, not now so much about Shane's past, as about what he might do if Fletcher tried any move against him. They would stop me and ask questions when I was hurrying to and from school. I knew that father would not want me to say anything and I pretended that I did not know what they were talking about. But I used to watch Shane closely my, myself and wonder how all the sly, slow climbing tenseness in our valley could be so focused on one man and he seemed to be so indifferent to it. For of course he was aware of it, he never missed anything. Yet he went about his work as usual, smiling frequently now at me, bantering mother at mealtimes in his courteous manner, arguing amiably as before with father on plans for next year. The only thing that was different was that there appeared to be a lot of activity across the river it was surprising how often Fletcher's cowboys were finding jobs to do within view of our place. Then one afternoon when we were stowing away the second and last cutting of hay, one fork of the big tongs we were using to haul it up to the loft broke loose. Have to get it welded in town, father said in disgust and began to hitch up the team. Shane stared over the river where a cowboy was lazily riding lazily back and forth by a bunch of cattle. I'll take it in, he said. Father looked at Shane and he looked across the way and he grinned. All right, as good as time as any. He slapped down the final buckle and started for the house. Just a minute and I'll be ready.